So what are we going to do today? Uh, actually, the fun part, uh, I really wanted to make a talk about the R8 and D8, but then I figured out that there's a lot of things to talk before actually, to, like before I'm reaching what is D8 and R8 and, and what's the improvement it's made for the Android, actually I need to explain all other stuff that happened in the Android. So there is, uh, we'll start our journey, uh, what is the CPU, how it's working in Android, JVM, how it's related to the compilers, interpreter, J compilers, and we're talking about the DEX, we'll learn a bit, little bit about the opcodes, and then actually I I'm going to, to finish with the D8 and R8. Um, why? Because I think it's, uh, it's essential that every developer will understand what happened under the hood, right? Because at the moment, when you understand actually how it works, it's make you the better developer. It's make you to be make the better de decisions uh, and be much more aware about how to solve the bugs, where they come from, how to debug it. And actually, it's make you someone that really, it's actually the difference between being the just a developer, the be very talented, cool, knowing, knowledgeable developer. Um, and we start with the CPU, right? Uh, so CPU, if you know, uh, it's basically uh, CPU receives the instructions. Uh, it's actually set of different set of the, it's called gates. So there's a NAND, AND, OR, XOR, uh, and other different gates executing the structures, store something in the memory cache, uh, and move forward before. It's a very dumb thing, right? And this is actually how we, the, the initial CPU was built. Um, with the time, it's, it's evolved much more. And Android, it's, the CPU itself is much more complex. It's, uh, in, inside of the CPU, there is different parts that dealing with, uh, it's tailored actually for different needs. Like for example, there is in CPU itself, there's a part that tailored to work with the Bluetooth. It's, worse, it's so efficient with the Bluetooth instruction to make the whole communication, the whole instruction is much more efficient than regular CPU. And there are all of other things inside the CPU, like video codecs, audio codecs to processing the image, to processing the uh, out, uh, audio, uh, and actually, the, the whole thing is much more um, uh, complex involved than just the regular CPU on the desktop. Um, and if, you, like, if you're doing the native development, for example, I know there's a guys from the Gizmart, uh, you need to support different, there's different types of the CPU, right? Uh, different CPUs have different CPU instructions, so uh, the whole architecture is different. It requires us to compile our code to the different CPUs. So if you like, for example, you have your uh, C++ written code, so you need to compile it seven different times to different CPU, to different instruction. Um, and as a result, we have, first of all, if we're talking about Android, then we have like larger CPK, because the same code compiles seven times to the different CPU. And, and, you know, and besides that, dealing with the C and C++ code, ah, I was like writing code four years in the C, it was really completely disaster. Always somehow I succeed to memory leak uh, I thought I was very cautious about that. Um, and then actually, the new thing actually came to the world uh, to, give, to bring us abstraction. And the, the thing is called JVM. Um, it's actually allow us to developers, instead of dealing with like pointers and, and, and all these memory leaks, uh, to write very abstracted code. Right? It's, it, and, and it's called high order languages, like Java, for example. Uh, and instead of dealing like things that tailored for a specific CPU, for a specific operation system, or specific for the drivers, we receive this abstraction. And the abstraction is called Java APIs. So we're dealing with the Java APIs. So for us, there's no Bluetooth specific driver that uh, was written by Huawei. There is a Java API for dealing with the Bluetooth. Right? And if we want something specific, we, we have this uh, outside library that we can download, it, uh, make it part of our project. Um, so we, in a way it's work, we write the code in the Java, right? We have this Java, Java compiler called Java C. It's compiled the code to something called bytecode. Okay. Bytecode usually have extension of dot class, and then actually it's executed uh, on the JVM. And JVM is uh, independent, it's running on, like for us as developers, it doesn't matter if it's JVM for the Mac OS, for uh, Windows, for the Linux, or any other system that's going to be invented in the future, right? For us, it's, for developers, it's very transparent. We write the code in Java, using Java API. And this is the idea of GVM. So how is GVM is built? How it's, it's, how it's look it's inside, right? It's very uh, essential to understand. It's, and it's built in three layers. So there, there is a class loader, class loader layer, there is a, a data layer, and the execution engine layer. And I will walk through briefly it just to give you a sense of the uh, understanding what is happening inside. So there is a, the top level is the class loader level. 
Uh, and this, and first of all, it's, it's, it's responsible for loading all the classes. So first of all, it's loading all the Java things, all the Java runtime things. Of course, it's also loading our application uh, classes. And then there is a linkage uh, step, where it's actually going over our bytecode and verifies everything is correct. There is no corrupted bytecode and uh, everything works correctly. So there is also the prepare stage, where they allocate all the static variables, give them different va default values. Uh, uh, and then actually it's go to the utilization where we have all real values assigned to the uh, all static variables and all our static uh, blocks are executed. And the second layer is actually runtime the layer, uh, the data itself. So we have, uh, you know, I think most of you are familiar with that. If not, uh, raise your hand, I'll explain more. Uh, but we have this meta area where all, we have all our class level data stored. We have our heap area where all new objects are stored. So every time we're doing the new object is, is, is there. Then we have a stack area where for every single thread that have in our system, we have our uh, runtime stack. Uh, we have the PC register is actually uh, what's the current instruction that is executed by uh, current thread, like the pair each thread. And of course, we have the stack for our native methods that executed, because at the end of the day, there is a native code that executed on the CPU using the operating system. And then actually we come to the interesting part. And the interesting part is the execution engine. Um, so firstly, there is a garbage collection. Uh, I think most of you are familiar. Uh, it's actually something instead of we are managing the pointers and the locations or the allocations, uh, there's someone that manages us, uh, it's for us. So we just create the new objects and, and the rest for the, for the JVM itself. Uh, and there is a, a GNI interface, a native meta interface, and uh, native meters libraries that are actually executing uh, the code itself. And there's a two things that are very important in context of our application and related to Android. The first one is the interpreter. So interpreter received the code and actually it's interpreting it. So it's received the byte code and it's try to understand what this opcode doesn't mean and translate it to the CPU instruction, so the native code. Uh, but it has a huge disadvantage, it's very slow. So we have something that come to, uh, uh, to overcome this disadvantage called G compiler. So the G compiler can compile things compile the, the, uh, some amount of the code. There's a different uh, approaches for that, but it compi can compile some certain amount of code and execute it on the CPU. And the way it's worked together, so we have this our class file, right, as part of the Java compiler, going to the GVM, and then if it's cold code, cold code does mean that actually the code is executed only once, okay? So there is some sort of trash in what is considered cold code or hot code. There is some sort of static analysis run on our code, and if it's called code, it's going to the interpreter. And interpreter turn around to turn it to the native code, and actually we see something on the screen, right? It's turning to the uh, codes for the CPU. Uh, and if it's considered as a hot code, for example, what is the hot code? It's like method that, like loops, for example. It's the hot code that executed again and again and again. So if we need to interpret it, it's, it's uh, like every single uh, iteration, it's very time consuming, not performance, and like we already did that. So we can pre-compile it. So JIT is exactly what he's doing. He actually compiling as much as he can uh, according to some certain of threshold of speed and memory, and then it's executed. And it happens all the time. So every time we are running our application, we have or interpreter working, or the JIT uh, the compiling and uh, executing the, the native code. Questions till now? We have plenty of time. Yes, no, you can ask in Russian. Uh, so the question was, uh, is uh, who decide what is the hot code and what is the cold code? So uh, there is a different approaches. Uh, there is a, like, uh, we can compile or the whole methods or the line by line or a, or a, it's called trace. Uh, it's very similar to line by line. Uh, so we have the profiling that actually running all the time. You can consider it as the counter. Right, so there's, uh, for each line of code, we have some sort of counter how much is executed. And according to this counter, it's considered it's the hot code or not code. Actually, the whole point, like the, the, the question, maybe I, I can continue the question, why not to compile everything in advance, right? Why not to take the whole, whole thing and consider it as the hot code, let's compile it and, and run. And then actually the problem is in the, that you're compiling the things that you not, not necessarily need. So you execute only once, you already pay this price for interpreting the things, but you only use it once and then you just waste space on the device. Um, so how it's related, yeah. 
wait, 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 wait. We are still in before the Android. It's like the next slide. There, there. Um, so yeah, let's move because you know, the, the most interesting stuff is there. So how is it related to the Android? So we talked before we talked about the JVM dot class file Java compiler, right? So first, th there's a couple things to understand the reason why the world is a little bit different from the j just regular JVM. Uh, you know, even today, I have a couple of folks that then come and ask to me, do I have a charger? Uh, especially if you, are, uh, you have iPhone, like it's, 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 it's always the problem, charger. So in our world, in Android world, it's a problem, problem of the limited resources, that we have limited amount of power, limited amount of si CPU cycles, that we have limited amount of storage on the device, like in terms like memory and storage, and we need to consider it, right? The regular JVM is not tailored for this need. It's not tailored for these restrictions that all modern CPUs are living under them. Um, so we just can't run things endlessly. We can't store things endlessly because there's limited amount of storage, the limited amount of power, uh, and we need to, to, to be careful what we're doing or actually what we are not doing. Uh, and in order to explain to you what actually, what's the difference between Android and the regular world, I'll go give you this example. So you have to consider this method, right? So it's very simple. It's received two ints, make them uh, multiple by between them and some constant, right? Uh, if we look on regular JVM, uh, this is the regular dot class file. Um, don't worry, it's, it's only square, sc scary on the first time. Uh, the main idea of that it, it is not just, to, don't need to understand that, uh, it's actually, it's example of the code, uh, it's very large, there's a lot of lines, but it's something called that stack-based um, code. It, it's the, the way that JVM is work is actually the whole variables he stores in the stack. So when he needs to multiply something, he first needs to put two, two variables in the stack, then pop them, multiply, put the, the result back again, and then if they want to multiply something in, then they need to pop it again, uh, multiply, put inside the stack, et cetera, et cetera. Think about the variable that was popped at the beginning, and at the end of the function, there is other variables already exist in the stack, then you need to use the, the last one, right? So it's, it's turns out it's very inefficient. And if we're looking still in, in Android world, where we sh should be very, very efficient in what we're doing, so uh, we need to do something different, and something different called DEX format. So, Guys from Google thought about that, and, and they come with a, uh, with a DEX format that uh, actually is registers based. So instead of storing variables in the stack, we're storing in the register. So uh, don't worry, I'll briefly explain to you later uh, what, how to read the opcode. But actually, you see from this example from, I think it was 10 code, 10, 10 different instructions in two round just in three instructions. Right? It's, 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 it's much more efficient in terms of uh, CPU cycles and in terms of uh, space on the disk. But how the hell I do read this DEX file, right? It's, it's, it's first time you see it's like, <gasps> DEX, how we read it? Right? It's, we, we like to read Java. And, and the thing is very, very simple. Uh, it's only the beginning, it looks like, wow, it's the Chinese. Uh, but once you will try it, you understand that it's, it's built very, very like human friendly and you can understand that. So first of all, there is a website, uh, Google sources, you can go and see actually all the opcodes, actually all the instructions that Dalvik is using. Dalvik is the uh, Android JVM. Okay, it's called Dalvik, Dalvik Virtual Machine. And the instructions is, 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 is there, and they're very simply. Um, there is a types, base type, so you know, if you, you are probably most of you are knowing Java. So the types are the same. So we have like int, uh, i for int, j for long, z for boolean, d double, float, etc. Or classes are actually having the full package in their name, so like Java link object, right? Or, or uh, com, dot, uh, com slash Android slash Academy slash my class, for example, right? Arrays will going to have like bracket and the type of array. For example, array of int will have bracket and i, or bracket and object if the type of array of object or two brackets in different examples. And we have if we have a list of types, it just can continuation of the different types all together. And I will give you an example. Consider the method that everyone here know, right? If you don't know, check in the uh, view source causes. So we have this op uh, obtain style attributes method, right? And what he received inside. I trust you already can, uh, can read it, right? So what's the first parameter that we see inside? We see the object attribute set, right? And then we have bracket i says this is array. 
right? And then we have another i stays for int, and another one for int as well. So it's become the method that we're very familiar with, right? Attribute styles with receiving the attribute set, array of ints, int, and another one, right? So it's, it's, you become much more familiar. No worries, I will give you more explanation. So let's like, practice about that. Look on this method, right? In the moment you understand this, it's much more, it's like clearly what it's doing. So what happened inside? First of all, we have our method, uh, the signature of the method, right? We have swap, the first parameter, you already know that, what is that? Interray, right, it's interray. And then what's next? Int, yeah, so you already know how to read the opcodes. Cool. Then we have something called registers. Registers and six, it means that in this current method, we're going to use six registers to store our values. And here are example. So we have opcode called a get, it's array get. It's going to p1 array parameter, the first parameter, in the place p2 is the second parameter, and store the value inside v v0, right? How complex is that? Another one is actually add int. So what is doing? Guess, guesses? It's taking int and store it in some value. So it's actually we take the int, we we, we adding it to the R parameter p2, and we store it in v1, right? Register v1. Again, a get. So we're going to the different place in our array in actually in v1, the new calculated uh, place, right, in the array, and we stored the result in v2. What is happening in next? What is the a put? Guesses? A stands for array. What is the put? We're putting something in array. Hey, how complex it is. Uh, so what's happening in the a put? So we're going, we take the v2, it's the, the first register, and they put it in the p, p array p1 in the place p2. The second one, similar, just with different uh, indexes, right? Uh, what is doing this function? Guys, there's a written in the method. <laughs> it's called swap. It's actually swapping two places in the array, right? It's doing this, yeah? Now you know how it's looking in the Java bytecode, right? Uh, sorry, in the Davic bytecode, right? It, it's, it's, it's not really complex as, as it seems from the first side. But I have another question for you. I said there's a six registers, but I showed you only five. Where's the sixth? What? No. Yeah, who said that? You, I have a present for you. Take it. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is a hidden parameter uh, that always exists, uh, sorry, if not like, but, but it's, 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 it's pillow, so it's, it's, you know, it's soft. Pillow fun. <laughs> Do you want to tell us something? Uh, so, um, as, what's your name? Anton. As Anton said very correctly, there is a hidden parameter in all functions that don't have this static parameter. So it's, at the moment it's not static, we have all this parameter inside our, our method, that inside the register p0, this actually it's this, the instance of current class that we are working on, okay? Um, another example, why not to practice more? Who said that opcodes are boring? So what we have right here? So first of all, we have like, we have uh, opcode called const uh, that's storing some value like eight in the hex value in v8. Basically, it's actually uh, uh, things going to say that I'm going to define new array of size eight. And then another opcode, we have new array, guess what it's doing? Uh, creating new array at the register v0 and store it there, right, of the size eight. And another one, we have fill array data that storing in VA, v0 register, something called, when you have two dots, it's uh, with a, some name array, it's called label. So it's going to the place array 12 and fill it with the data. Can you guess what is the doing? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually not, it's similar to go to, uh, but actually it's, it's referring, referencing to where is the data itself uh, relying. And um, the data is, we just need to look for the label array 12, and we will find out that there is a array data 
with the values inside, and values in the, usually in the X format, so we have values here, 47188, basically, this is it, okay? Just three lines of code that creating this, creating the array populated with the data. Now you can read 80% of all that like byte code that created, trust me. Still, there is last example to go over there. Uh, so what happened, actually happened here? New instance, wow! How complex is that? It just create new instance of the class that we just declared. So we install it inside P1 uh, register, right? So we have new dex example class stored in one P1. And then we have something called invoke direct. Invoke direct. What is actually doing is in, in, is uh, uh, invoking, actually starting in our in, in simple English, it's starting constructor. When it's called for invoke direct and init on the class, it's actually calling for a constructor of this specific class. Why? It, what does it mean invoke direct? Invoke direct. There's two types: invoke direct and invoke vi invoke ah, invoke virtual. Invoke direct is mean that it's uh, calling for the methods that can be overridden by the children's. And invoke virtual, sorry, and th there is another function that's written there, invo invoke virtual is actually calling for the function that can be overridden by the children's. So here, for example, we invoke in virtual, we calling for the function that can be overridden by children's with two parameters on P1. What is the P1? Dex example, right? It's the class instance of the dex example stored in the register P1, and we called uh, you remember how the swap was look? What it, what's, what's the two parameters? Array, right, and the int. So we can call it with a v0 and v1, the same uh, things that we decide, that we define here, right? v0, and the constant itself was here, right? So we create the constant, 5, and store it in v1, right? It's actually the opcode of this is const, right, const 4. Uh, and we call it actually basically it is, right? And then we return void because our function function not returning anything. So basically this what is equivalent in the Java, right? We create a new instance, call for the swap method. Questions? Great. So let's move forward. Um, so we talk about the DEX files, right? So we know that, that the, our Dalvik virtual machine, uh, it, it's, it's uh, receiving DEX files. But how the whole framework looks like, and uh, you know, I'll give a brief example, or actually a reminder, uh, what's happening inside. I, I guess most of you are familiar with this diagram. So we have our top layer, uh, talking about the apps, right? The, we have write this code in the Java, and then we have our Android framework, uh, the layer that's written in the Java, uh, that we use constantly still with the Java, and it's like, you know, activity manager is the one that starts with activity or location manager if we're asking for the GPS um, or fragment manager. And then we have the layer, uh, it's the green layer, right? Uh, we have, it's, it's usually written in the native code, in C or C++ code, and it's the one that uh, actually it's kind of bridge between the Java framework to actually to using the, uh, through the whole, whole is the hardware uh, abstraction layer. Uh, you know, and for simplicity, let's say, the, the native code, the one that's written in the green, green the one that uh, C and C++ library, is uh, communicating directly with the kernel level, where all manufacturers is actually creating, putting their drivers, you know, how we work with the different, like, GPS or display or Bluetooth and other stuff. Um, and then we have our uh, runtime, the one that actually I, I just uh, explained you briefly about, the Dalvik, right? The one actually that receive the DEX file and execute it uh, on the device. Um, so how the Java becomes the Dalvi code? And I will remind you how it's working in Android. Um, so in Android we have our uh, source files and we have our resources, right? We have the XML, we have our images, videos, and Android manifest. And all this resource is going to something called APT tool. And the APT tool produces two things. First of all, it produces our Java. It's just mapping between placing the memory and the resource itself. If you look inside, you will see hex address of the memory, and then we have all our compiled resources uh, as one of the output. Then our source files, all our activities and fragments and managers that we're using go to something called Java compiler, uh, and it's produced the dot class. But we said, hey, Dalvik using the dex files, right? It's not the class files. So we have something called dex compiler that take the Java classes and produce dex files, and those dex files actually package inside the APK builder. 
uh, and APK Builder produce APK file, right? Basically, APK file is, is just, just a regular zip file. You know, and this is actually how the Android is started. So Android's version one point something, this is actually what happened almost, like Gradle wasn't part of the, the first version, but this is how Android evolved at the beginning. So we have very immature system, very ugly by the way. And the system was used mainly by developers. You know, basically, I remember the time when I was in university and we have course together with uh, guys, uh, girls basically, from the management and someone asked who have the Android phone, so the all developers raise the hand, and who have iPhone phone, so all girls from the uh, uh, psychology and management raise the hands. So it was like, System, very ugly one, working on very inefficient phones. But since then, the the old like you know the, the world has really become very mature. Then Android today is is system very good looking. I will dub is even much better than iPhone. Um, it's much more robust. It's require much more uh, from us as developers to to think more, to produce nice animations, to think about user experience. And actually, it's it's become much system that require much more resources. That require much more uh, thing to think about. And uh, as a fact, there is a lot of improvements that happen to support this growth, to support this evolution. Um, and one of them is actually, a, a, before we're going to talk about art, first of all, one of them is to support all this fragmentation. It's actually separation of how level, uh, you, you already heard about the project variable. And by the way, tomorrow I saw there is a specific lecture about that, so I'm not going to dig inside. Uh, so there is a, a, a separation, completely separation between the hardware implementation the one that uh, companies like uh, Huawei or Samsung are creating and from the rest of the framework. And the second changes is actually that the Dalvik, the same virtual machine that was executing our code, uh, was replaced with ART. And the difference coming in, remember when I explained about the, the JVM, I talked about two things, the interpreter, the one that actually interpreting code, and the JIT compiler. And the difference actually uh, coming in, in, uh, in a way where that before the art, we, what we had, that we have the DEX files that went, went to the Dalvik, and the Dalvik was deciding about the, if it's code code or hot code. If it's code code, then interpreter was interpreting at and put it inside of the device and executing that. Or if it was the hot code, then we have a JIT compiler that was compiling as much as he can and executing on the device. So this was with the Dalvik. What happened with art is actually when we install our app or up dating it from the Play Store, uh, we unpack the DEX file from, from the APK and we're running the AOT compiler. And the AOT compiler actually produced the AOT binary. It's like the binary that's going to be executed right away. At the moment when we click on our app, we run it, it's low the AOT binary, and we just enjoy our app. We don't need this uh, longer at the interpreter and the JIT compiler. We just have one compiler, AOT compiler, and that's it. But, it always but. Uh, it calls different problems. First one that, you know, uh, who had the Nexus phone here? So most of you basically know the pain of upgrade, right? Uh, you, you click on the upgrading system, it's like taking hour. And uh, we see this dialogue of uh, optimizing apps. What actually, why it's happened is because when you're upgrading the framework, like this, and the Nexus users are receiving update like once in a month, like security updates. Uh, the all apps need to be optimized for, uh, for the current version, right? So it's need to recompile it again and again and again. And you have like around 100 applications, then you need to recompile it again. And then you, this is the dialogue that you see. And the second thing is actually storage. So now we're actually storing, uh, for all application, we're storing double. We have this DEX file with all resources and we have AOT binary for every single application. So basically we just compiled everything even what we're not using. So like in terms of space, it's really, really inefficient. So it's like, yeah, the solution, but uh, not really. It's like very harmful one. Um, so Google said that, yeah, let's move forward and let's mix both of the ways. Let's mix the JIT and the interpreter and the AAT compiler. So in a way it's worked today, you click on the app, right? It's start the app and then it's checking. If it's this method, it already was compiled and exists an AAT binary, then we're going to use the AOT binary, we are executing on our art, on our uh, virtual machine, and you will see the result on the screen. And if it's not compiled method, then it's, go to the dex, it's using, going to use raw DEX files, 
and it's go to the art, and then art decide if it's cold, co cold code, then we use the interpreter, uh, or if it's hot code, then we use the JIT. JIT, as I said before, JIT compile as much as he can, right? So he can basically profile the code all the time. So why not to use it again and again? And the major problem comes that uh, the same compiled code by JIT, the all hot areas of our code, go into something called profiles. And then when the device is idle and charging, then something dex to out is called. It's actually a compiler. It's, it's something that's turning the dex files into AOT binary. And the same hot areas that was pre-compiled by JIT and stored in the local cache inside the app storage uh, compiled again. Why compiled again? Because the JIT and AOT different compilations and they de using different optimization. But then our binary become larger and larger. So in the first time, we don't have anything. So we put it in our, we execute our app, we use interpreter JIT or AOT, it's grenade the profile files and then we recompile it again using these profiles, using this uh, input, and when we have our optimized app. And actually, every time we are running that, we more and more optimizing our app. So our application becomes faster and faster with every single. In average, uh, it takes about eight launches and usage, eight usage of the app to optimize it in about 70% of the app. But the optimization there is, wasn't over. Guys from Google looked on, on what is actually happening and say, okay, so we have this local optimization for every single device, but if I have, let's say, pixel device, right, and, and, and Alex have also pixel, pixel device, w device with the same specifications, why not to share my profiles, profiling of the code of the same application with Alex? So the profile files start to be uploaded to the Play Store, and then, then someone, Alex, for example, downloading our app, then it's not downloading only app, it's also downloading the whole profiles. And then it's installed in his device, and from the first moment Alex is going to launch, his app is actually uh, already being optimized. How cool is that? But application is working, like the, the whole uh, optimization of the application is fine. But we as a developer still have a huge problem, right? The Gradle build running. The, grade th the build times are very, very, very inefficient. Um, and you know, uh, I'm part of the something called CAP. It's basically a lot of folks, uh, developers for Android. And when they ask what's the major things they want to improve, actually it was build time. Everyone know about the instant run, right? It's never worked. <laughs> But this is actually what we want. We want the experience when we change something, and it's immediately we see it on the device. We don't need to, f to wait for one minute, two minutes, or 10 minutes in, in multimodal um, applications. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's really the demand for that is really strong. So we have very optimized applications that are running on the device, but we have an inefficient build system. Um, and the problems to understand actually where the whole problems is coming and what is uh, being optimized in D8 or R8 is coming from understanding that actually Java that we're using today is not actually Java. So we're basically using subset of Java uh, that was introduced to the world, I think, like 12 years ago, Java 6. We're still stuck there. So if I'm going to use, like, a, the big announcement of Java 8 was Lambda function, right? So I will take, use the Java uh, Lambda function. What happened then? I will try to compile it with the DEX compiler, right? I will take the class file that was compiled by Java and we'll put it in the DEX compiler, I will receive the exception. Exception say, hey, I have this opcode called invoke dynamic, have an idea what is it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not exist in my uh, opcodes. Uh, so we can't really use that. Uh, and there is a retro lambda that was introduced that did some manipulation, et cetera, et cetera. So how Google solved that? Uh, there's a transformation that ho happened on the file, on dot class file, and doing some manipulations on our class before it should be compiled. And one of the transformation is actually going, uh, called desugaring. So the thing is actually that happened on this device at the moment when we have this dot class file that produced by Java compiler, we have desugaring transformation that looking inside our dot class file in all opcodes and change them to something that Dex compiler can understand. For example, what happened with a Lambda function that instead of using Lambda in the invoke dynamic, uh, invoke dynamic opcode, is basically turning it in static class with a singleton instance. 
That's it. This is like basically what doing the desugaring. But what happened is actually it's 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 processing the whole file again and it's doing different passes over the file and and it's part each pass taking time. So in order to solve that, they introduced D8. All right. Really, it's phone calling. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the D8? Uh, first of all, it's uh, if you're still using Android Studio 3.0, uh, in order to use it, you need to enable in the Gradle properties. If you're using the latest Android Studio, like 3.2, it's by default it's already working in your studio. Um, by the way, the some fan fact, uh, it was published by Jake. Um, it says like uh, why the name D8, D8. So the fun fact is actually that when the uh, engineers discussed about the 20 minutes, yeah, I get it. Thank you. Uh, when the engineers discussed about uh, uh, about the D8 itself before it was DB8, they say it sounds dope, like sounds cool. Uh, and then seven other other people says, yeah, it's dope. Uh, and the guy that took notes wrote it dope multiple eight. And when the engineer named the the D8, is actually it's called dope eight. Uh, so it was mis misinterpreted, and then actually it was uh, shortened to the just me dope eight to the D8, and this is how it's come to the world. But what was the improvement? Uh, so first of all, obviously, it's the build time, right? So it's very obvious, boring. Uh, but interesting thing, and not a lot of uh, people know about it, uh, as I mentioned before, um, our stock Android devices like Pixels, right? Pixels or Nexuses, uh, they are different from devices that are produced by Huawei, for example, or by me. All, by the way, all Chinese devices, they're doing something crazy under the hood, like optimizations that nobody really understands why, but they are doing them. And actually, the whole things that happen under the hood, even Dalvik itself, or Dalvik, or Art, or JIT uh, compiler, they're slightly different. Why? Have no idea. They have all their reasons. But as a result, we have different bugs, issues that happen uh, where our bytecode uh, with different devices. Like, for example, when you saw that some variable is null, but there is no chance that it's null, like probably there's a problem in the JIT compiler. And it's, it's like true story. Um, in our D8, uh, and here I'm showing the repository of R8 because R8 is uh, open source, but R8 is, is based on the D8. We will talk about it in a couple of slides. But uh, in, in D8 in SAL itself, he knows uh, exactly what the opcodes are problematic ones, what the opcodes can cause the problems because everyone is reporting uh, these problems uh, to the issue tracker, Google issue tracker. And then he's, uh, he has this uh, different function that actually can uh, look into your opcode and say, okay, uh, I have this restriction, so this one I can use with a minimum SDK 26, this one I can use with a minimum SDK 21, because this and that actually changed. So D8, know which the opcodes to use uh, and which optimization to use according to the problematic opcode. So it actually is, is, is doing not only optimization in terms of performance, but also in, in optimization in terms of fragmentation of the devices. And actually, it's, it's, it's really, really, really useful um, and cause less problems and applications to be much more robust. So back to what we had before. So we have, if like we're using Java, uh, it's producing the dot class files, then we have the sugaring stage, and then other transformation like Progard or Kotlin, for example, right? So Kotlin stain produces dot class files, right? And then they go to the DEX compiler, that one actually turning the dot class files to the DEX. So what happened in the D8? that we no longer have this desugaring step. So desugaring has become part of D8. We have the same transformation that happened and we have the dot class file going to our transformation like Progard, produce the dot class files and going inside the D8. D8 already know how to deal with all this desugaring, with all this lambda function. It actually bring, bring a lot of different improvements and then as a result we have the dex files. Um, I tried it at home, need some improvements. Uh, I run it like 100 times using the CLI for Gradle, like Gradle command. Uh, in average, I have like improvements of two seconds on my small application in Colgen. Uh, and the size, like 200 kilobytes. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's small, but it's already improvement. Hey, like it saved me two seconds in, in, in on average. So if you will multiply like in a day how much you build your project, 100 times, multiply by two seconds, 
hey, it's become a really huge improvement. Um, but actually, it's, it's just the beginning. So we have this improvement, but then our rate is actually come to the, to the picture. And uh, again, you can enable it in the Gradle pro properties in, uh, in, in the last 3.300 studio release candidate. There is a huge warning come to you say, hey, it's experiment. And actually, you're going to suffer a lot, like really a lot. There is a lot of issues. Like it took me about like one hour to so, to, to overcome or actually to find the over uh, uh, find different workarounds uh, in order to uh, uh, to cause my project to build. But once I build it, uh, I really saw the improvement. And actually, what happened is that R8 is a replacement for the Progard. It's still using the same uh, uh, the same syntaxes, right? So the same Progard rules will work for the R8. Uh, actually, R8 includes itself the D8. It has the same code base. It's open source, by the way. You can contribute to that and fix different issues. Um, but it's not a progress. So under the hood, it's worked differently. It's make different optimization. And like a reminder, progress, the main, his responsibility was to shrink, to optimize, to obfuscate. Uh, R8 mostly doing the same, but not the same. Like there is uh, just like, you say like it's a beta version that's doing half of what Proger is doing, but actually it's 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 much more Android aware, and the big plus it's very Kotlin aware, so it's it's start to make the optimization even within the Kotlin code itself, the Kotlin not code uh, Kotlin byte code, uh, and intend to be much more faster uh, than uh, Proger plus a, a Dex file, uh, Dex file Dex compiler. So again, some sort of like metrics. Um, on my application, on average, I saw about 10 seconds improvement. It's really huge for me. Uh, it was like, like running Dex plus Progard versus R8, the regular one. And the most interesting thing, the R8 itself was much more efficient in order to remove the methods that no longer used uh, my application. Remember, Progard is actually one of the things that he's doing. He's stripping the methods that no longer used uh, in my app, right? So for example, if I have fragments in support library and, and longer, no longer use them, then let's strip them and not put them inside our APK. Um, but the thing, so uh, before, before the other thing. Um, so if we look on the uh, bytecode that produced by, for example, we take the Java and the, the regular Lambda. And you know it, it's just a lugger, lambda, lambda, trust me. Uh, I'm the engineer. Um, and we look inside the, like, uh, Dex file uh, that produced by Dex compiler, the Dex file that produced by R8, is actually almost completely different code. Uh, first of all, it's less instructions. Second, it's really different in the way it works. Uh, and if I will take the Kotlin code, the same lambda, uh, it's already a slight improvement. Uh, and also, there's a big improvement in terms of memory management because it's using uh, it's not using it's using much less register than in yet before. So less instructions, more memory efficient. Uh, actually, we can even do more. So inside the progress or slash R8, there is a three flags, like I, flags that I really suggest you to use. And uh, first one, repackage class allows to repackage to remove, uh, to move the classes within different packages. Then actually, the another one allow you to remove all this uh, access modification, like private, public, because Bytecode really don't care about is it private or, or, or public. And actually, the, the third one allow you to flatten the whole hierarchy. So you long no longer need your packages. Um, and as a result, I saw, so it's less or more the same, uh, uh, same time of building. But in terms of size, it's become almost 100 kilobyte less. And it's exit to remove two times more methods than it had before. So, main, so my APK is really small, only five kilobytes, uh, and around 48,000 uh, 40, different methods. If you have large applications, so the savings will be much more. And it's actually really, really cool. But don't forget, it's still experimental. So, and, and here's actually my sending to you to finish this presentation, is actually here we need you. We, I need our community, we need you developers, first of all, to try, to suffer a little bit. You know, it's, it's really good to suffer to try to find the overcome of this issue, to fill the bags, because only in this way we will tell the Google to improve his build system that really care about that, will provide all the issues, because you have your apps. 
you have all the problems that happen inside your apps. We have all these cases that cause issues. And once we will do that, we actually will be responsible for our old tooling. Our aid is for us, not for Google, for us to use it. So I encourage you, you will go home. Not today, tomorrow. <laughs> Try to use RA, suffer a little bit, fill the box, and now we understand more actually what is working inside, how it's working under the hood, and hey, let's build the tooling together with you. Thank you. Вопросы? По-русски, по-английски? Это как удобно. Окей. Okay. Uh, ты говорил про R8, что он является заменой прогварда и используется вместо него, вместо прогварда R8. Он по дефолту делает обфускацию или нет? Uh, по дефолту он, если ты не поставишь do not... Все те же самые рули, какие были в прогварде, работают точно так же, как работает в R8. Ну, то есть, то есть если ты... я в Белградле покажу, скажу, что не надо обфуссировать, он не будет обфуссировать? Да, если ты поставишь flag do not обфускать, то он не будет обфуссировать. Окей, okay, спасибо. Uh, в плане... В плане синтаксиса и в плане флагов все осталось то же самое. Под капотом работает совершенно по-другому. По поводу R8. Вот на том слайде, где был D8 и ProGuard, там получалось, что сначала ProGuard… Это? Нет, там схемка была. В каком порядке? Нет, с ProGuard. Ну, короче, вот, да. Тут получается, нет, дальше. Да, тут получается был сначала прогард, потом D8. А как с R8 будет? То есть он сначала будет преобразовывать всякие лямды, а потом а, ну, а потом офуссировать или в каком порядке? Нет, не будет, а, не будет разделения сначала то, потом это. Это будет все делать в один прогон. В этом здесь как бы и прикол, mm -hmm. что вместо того, что делать, там, есть как бы трансформации, да, то есть прогард uh, и дешугаринг это типы трансформации, которые есть в, во время билда, uh, и потом уже DDD компайлер. И это как бы по минимуму это два прохода, да. Я немножко вру, потому что прогард делает пять проходов сегодня, ну, в, в самой трансформации, пять проходов по, по всему, по всему .class файл. Uh, то, что будет с R8, это то, что у тебя за один проход делается вся оптимизация. Да, то есть как бы вместо того, чтобы делать вот эти вот uh, сначала один проход по всему коду, потом другой проход по всему коду, потом третий, потом четвертый, потом пятый. В смысле, и так далее. То есть, э, ну, в прогарде можно указать, допустим, сколько ты хочешь проход, проходов сделать. То есть, если ты, тебе пяти недостаточно, ты можешь десять например, да. сделать. А, и типа R8 есть... сделает это все за один, типа да. так оптимально, как да. прогард за десять. Да. да. А есть очень. Э, э, я знаю, это как бы звучит очень такое, типа умористически. Есть сравнение между прогардом и R8, которое было сделано. CEO компании Guardsquare, uh, Guardsquare uh, uh, у них же есть тул такой, DexGuard, uh, что он типа говорит о том, что в, сейчас это не настолько оптимизировано, как это есть, и что типа r не намного отличается, чем у ProGuard, и что r это сабсет uh, оптимизации, который ProGuard делает, типа r не делает не все. Uh, ну как бы он байс немножко, ну понятное дело, что его компания, но, с другой стороны, он говорит совершенно честно, что это просто процесс времени, когда рейд будет намного эффективнее, чем прогресс. Потому что прогресс, он затейлен под обычные классы. Ну, типа, Java оптимизации, да, то есть, как бы, dot class, он не знает, а прогресс не знает ни про Android, он не знает ни про систему, как она работает. А рейд это чисто андроидская штука. Да, то есть, как бы, он, 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 он более aware в контексте, в котором он работает. Опять же, Прогард, uh, он не Kotlin friendly, ну, Прогард не, не знает, что такое Kotlin. Kotlin знает, что такое Java, и оптимизация, и под этим все заточен. А uh, Array пишется изначально по то, что Kotlin это first class citizen language в Android, и под него надо тоже делать оптимизации под uh, Bytepad. Еще один вопрос. Uh, есть, ну, я так понимаю, вот, вернее, это так и есть, что D8, который в Android, это какая-то обрезанная версия настоящего D8, которую Google разрабатывает, которая умеет там и 12-ю Java уже, типа, тоже преобразовывать, там, типа, в 7-ю. А, а, и почему? Насколько я знаю, еще нет. 12-я Java там еще до очень далеко до этого. Есть, Джек недавно, по написал пост ну, вот, о том, да, что нужно пинать Google и говорить о том, что нужно сопротивить uh, Java 12 через uh, DeSugaring. И это, типа, можно. Но, но важно очень понимать, что значит на саппорт. Это не то, что, типа, у нас вот будет вся та эффективность, 
большой джавы, который есть во всем мире. Это значит, что у нас будет дешугаринг, то есть превращение э, вот да. этого вот эффективного кода, который очень красивый, в превращение в огромное количество инструкций, которые для, для байтка, потому что э, сам virtual машина, она не изменится, и обкоды, которые они есть, то есть пока у нас будет минус декей, да, не 26, как бы джаву мы использовать особо не сможем, да, то есть как бы э, еще много времени пройдет, пока как бы сможешь использовать фичеры последний Java, если мы захотим. И кроме этого, это не Java, это JDK, OpenJDK, что это немножко другое, чем Java Enterprise. Uh, okay. То есть, как бы, Google uh, сам, типа, пишет Java, вот этот вот OpenJDK, Contributed и так далее. То есть, как бы, нужно делать portability, uh, что мы хотим это произойти. Okay. Спасибо большое за доклад. Uh, ты сказал, что uh, D8 знает про, про проблемы с обкодом на разных э, API вершин. Да. Да. И если э, мы собираем приложение с мин API 21, например, значит ли это, что он вырежет все, он не будет использовать те инструкции, которые проблемные на 22, например, API, или это значит, что он добавит там, не знаю, две ветки кода для меньше 20? Нет, он скомпалит самые минимальные версии. И это будет одна ветка, по которой не будет использовать. Да, да. не будет вот этих if else, которые там ты думаешь, что происходит. Есть uh, в, стадии, в, в, в процессе uh, uh, virtual machine есть эта проверка верификации, которая верифицирует весь код. Если она хватает uh, обход, который она не знает, она. Uh, да. Спасибо за доклад. Uh, как я понимаю, D8 направлен на оптимизацию на количество методов и размер ну, деревьев файлов. А вот количество инструкций уменьшаемых, это может ухудшить скорость работы. Ну, те это... Теоретически да. Информация uh, но как бы, э, по идее не должно быть. Это значит, у, 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 уменьшить… Uh, меньше инструкций – это меньше инструкций для выполнения для CPU. Не факт, да, что да? это улучшить производительность. Ну, бывает. Как бы я с тобой соглашусь, а, но я думаю, что как бы надеюсь, что ребята в Гугле, которые пишут этот D8, понимают, что если они будут делать какой-нибудь IO блокинг вместо чего-нибудь какой-нибудь memory cache, то как бы, наверное, это да. Не кто там? Подожди, ты уже задавал кучу вопросов там вот сзади. Спасибо за доклад. У меня такой вопрос вот при компиляции вот этот D8 там R A и прочие вот эти штуки, они занимаются какими-то низкоуровневыми оптимизациями, там, не знаю, как инлайн-функции, вот да, да, это все да, при компиляции, да? Да, да. Ну, инлайн это низко, не низко уровне, это обычный доклад, ну, как бы, это же котлинская штука. Ионтон, спасибо за доклад, как обычно, очень все весело. А, я хотел бы уточнить просто для себя. А, то есть эта штука R8 сейчас уже все стабильно? Все? Нет. Ну, не, нет, нет. А, только так. То есть я не могу прийти там послезавтра а, на, вот на это, работу. Это, это скриншот со вчера. Ага. То есть вот еще, еще, короче, нельзя юзать, да, ее там прямо совсем. Ну, знаете, у меня маленький проект, и мы там не что-то такое большое делаем. У нас даже нет Котлина. У нас там все очень просто, как можно быстрее там do market. Я реально поковырялся где-то час, замененным всякими разными классами, понять вообще, что это такое, для того, чтобы сделать это работать. Я думаю, более тяжелый проект – это еще больше боли. Так, ну, то есть ты на стоит. маленьком проекте, там что-то нахватал каких-то багов, да? Ну, как бы там не то, что нахватал там баль, там типа а, не все он понимает. Там, например, у меня а класс... это выявляется где? На этапе компиляции? Да, или... на этапе компиляции у а, тебя как бы там, он там. выскакивают всякие ошибки, которые непонятно откуда там всякие мерч классов или какие-то классы пустые там. А если скомпилилось, то вроде как. Ну тоже не факт. То есть как бы скомпилировать такой типа, ну может быть теоретически array может убрать какой-нибудь класс, который там неправильно посчитал его usage и типа и ты там в runtime в exception не вылетишь, потому что просто класса этого нету. Я просто уже обрадовался. Подумал, что завтра можно выкинуть прогуард на R8. Слушай, я знаю ребят, которые вот вышел work manager. Я рассказал про него презентацию. Он был в Альфа 001. Ребята затащили его в продакшн. Есть такие. Ну, как бы это вопрос up to you. Понятно, спасибо.